Yeah, you can just edit, right? And what about sound? Yeah. Is that microphone there? Why is it the main one? Put that one on. Is that the one that's live too? Frequently invited speaker for conferences and of course constantly uh, invited uh, for radio presentations. He and his wife, Lana Lee, who is present here uh, today, reside most of the year in eastern France and they run uh, an annual academy every July. That is the International Academy of 
Right? This has become so successful that in the 20th year, it's already fully subscribed. In fact, it was by the end of September. And this means if you're interested in first class training in digital public care, you want to get on the stick now simply to help get a place in the 2017 program, uh, which has a very fine lineup of speakers. Well, much more I can say about Dr. Montgomery, and I think I said last night on the positive nature. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I fear that uh, the whole world could not contain the books that he's uh, written or read. So, today our focus is in controversy and issue on the Sunset Rebellion, on what Luther really thought about scripture, and his likely response to current. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, let me reiterate that if you are thinking of doing our program in France, uh, you should certainly sign up, even though it's almost two years before the program takes place, uh, the next time that it's available. We are completely full for July of 2016. But 2017 is the year of the anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation, so there's no better time to be in Europe. Uh, we would strongly suggest that you consider this. And the website uh, for this, to get information, is www.apologeticsacademy, as one word, apologeticsacademy.eu, EU for Europe. Uh, in Europe, uh, people start celebrating Christmas at Advent, oddly enough. Uh, in the United States, I understand, <clears throat> Christmas is already being prepared. And so I should mention that uh, there is a Luther doll available for <clears throat> Christmas this year. Uh, you wind it up, and it just stands there. <laughs> We're going to see today what Luther's stance is on the matter of Scripture. And uh, the talk uh, is divided into several sections. The first section is incredibly boring. Uh, this consists of quotations from Luther uh, to indicate exactly what his position is on the authority, on the reliability, and on the clarity of Holy <laughs> Scripture. You undoubtedly already know what his position is in that respect, but uh, trained as a historian, I cannot resist primary sources. So we're going to get this from the horse's mouth, or in this case, from the reformer's mouth. Um, after that a boring start, uh, we're going to see what position on scripture is maintained uh, today in uh, mainline theological circles, in those circles that uh, are usually characterized as liberal theological circles. We're going to see what they have to say about Luther's view of Scripture and also what they obviously think we should believe about Scripture. Uh, at this point, you're going to become ill as you listen to what they think Luther said because it will be in stark contrast to what Luther himself said. So, we will need to move on to ask ourselves, why would anybody take that kind of view of Scripture and of uh, Luther's approach to it? What could possibly motivate people uh, to a view of <laughs> Scripture uh, which not only contradicts Luther, uh, but which in general contradicts uh, that of the historic Christian church? And having seen what the motivation is in all of that, we're going to ask ourselves, is this still a problem? Is it a problem in, in our circles? Surely not. I mean, after all, if the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was good enough for St. Paul, it ought to be good enough for everybody else. Uh, could, could there possibly be any difficulties uh, in our own context? And we're going to discover that, as a matter of fact, there are. And then, at the very end, we're going to ask ourselves another question. 
And that question is, why did Luther consider it so important that the scripture be authoritative, completely reliable, and the clearest of all books? Why did he consider that of such paramount importance? All right. Uh, we begin then with the boring part of the talk. Uh, of course, you're, you, you may uh, hold at the end of it that the whole thing was boring, but I don't believe you will. Hmm. Uh, what did Luther say about Holy Scripture? Well, <laughs> I begin with the statement that he made at Worms before Emperor Charles V. You are all acquainted with this. This is the source of the doll that just stands there. Said Luther, unless I am convinced by the testimonies of the Holy Scriptures or evident reason, for I believe in that neither the Pope nor councils uh, can be relied upon alone since it has been established that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the Scriptures that I have adduced and my conscience has been taken captive by the Word of God and I am neither able nor willing to recant, since it is neither safe nor right to act against conscience. God help me. Amen. Now, uh, this passage has been interpreted to mean that Luther was the great defender of conscience, uh, and uh, he was a forerunner of the, of the Enlightenment, uh, when uh, everything really centered on uh, one's right to make decisions in the area of religion. Of course, that's not what Luther is saying at all. He says expressly, my conscience is captive to the word of God. The word of God being the Holy Scriptures, uh, not the church, not its representatives, but the Bible itself. All right, other statements from Luther. These are either from the Weimar Ausgabe, uh, the uh, <clears throat> critical Latin German edition of uh, Luther's works, uh, or and or uh, from English translations uh, such as that published by uh, Concordia Publishing House. Says Luther, it is impossible for scripture to contradict itself except at the hands of senseless and hardened hypocrites. At the hands of those who are godly and understanding, it gives testimony to the Lord. Therefore, see to it how you can reconcile Scripture, which, uh, as you say, contradicts itself. I shall stay with the author of Scripture. There Luther is saying, <laughs> unqualifiedly, that if you find stuff in Scripture that appears to contradict itself, it doesn't. It doesn't. And you need to work on this to find the proper reconciliation. Uh, in uh, Luther's uh, larger catechism, he uh, quotes at least twice from St. Augustine, uh, the same quotation. And here it is. This is from Augustine. Luther quotes this with approval. I have learned that the books uh, called the Holy Scriptures uh, are, uh, are firmly to be believed, and none of these writers has ever erred. All others I read in such a way that I do not consider what they say to be the truth unless they prove it uh, by the Holy Scriptures. What Augustine was saying there uh, was, uh, if you are confronted with a variety of opinions. The only opinion which is final is that of the Holy Scriptures because the Holy Scriptures have never erred. Uh, Luther quotes this twice with uh, entire approval. Again, the saints were subject to error in their writings and to sin in their lives. Scripture cannot err. And again, we know that God does not lie. My neighbor and I, in short, all men may err and deceive, but God's word cannot err. All right. We proceed with other statements from the reformer. He who carefully reads and studies the scriptures will consider nothing so trifling that it does not at least <laughs> 
contribute to the improvement of his life and morals, since the Holy Spirit wanted to have it committed to writing. Nothing is too trivial in Scripture. All of it is there because the Holy Spirit led the writers to set it down. We see with what great diligence Moses, or rather the Holy Spirit, describes even the most insignificant acts and sufferings of the patriarchs. And, speaking of Jonah, who can think uh, this through to his satisfaction? A man lives three days and three nights in solitude, without light, without food, in the midst of the sea, in a fish, and then comes back. I dare say that uh, if, if you uh, came across this strange voyage elsewhere, would you believe it? Wouldn't you consider it a lie or a fable if it did not stand recorded in Scripture? Luther says there are a lot of very odd things in the Bible, things that you wouldn't normally accept. You need to accept them in this case because they are conveyed uh, by human writers through the action of the Holy Spirit. And we continue. If we're going to bore you, we're going to do it systematically. Says Luther, I have learned to ascribe the honor of infallibility only to those books that are accepted as canonical. I am profoundly convinced that none of these writers has erred. All other writers, however, however they may have distinguished themselves, in holiness or doctrine, I read in this way. I evaluate what they say not on the basis that they themselves believe a thing to be true, but only in so far as they are able to convince me by the authority of the canonical books or by clear reason. All right? And in his uh, debate with Erasmus on the issue of free will, Luther is particularly concerned with the fact that Erasmus is not willing to let the scriptures settle the issue. And this is what he says uh, in his uh, response to Erasmus. The notion that scriptures, um, that in scriptures some things are recondite and all is not plain was spread by the godless sophists uh, whom you represent, Erasmus. They have never yet cited a single uh, item to prove their crazy view, nor can they. And Satan has used these unsubstantial specters to scare men off from reading the sacred text and to destroy all sense of its value, so as to ensure that his own brand of poisonous philosophy reigns supreme in the church. I certainly grant that many passages in the scriptures are obscure and hard to elucidate, but that is due not to the exalted, that is due not to the exalted nature of their subject, but to our own linguistic and grammatical ignorance. Who will maintain that the town fountain does not stand in the light because people down some alley cannot see it, while everybody in the square can see it? What Luther is saying there is that when you find something difficult to understand in Scripture, the problem isn't Scripture. The problem is you. You are... Uh, caught in some kind of presuppositional byway, and as a result of this, you have cut yourself off from the clarity of the text, and if you would simply uh, present yourself in uh, immediate contact with the text and shelve your own presuppositions, the text would be clear. Now, uh, <laughs> It is awfully hard on the basis of those statements, which come from a wide variety of Luther's works, uh, to claim that Luther did not hold, number one, that the scriptures are the final authority uh, in matters of faith and learning. And they are infallible. They are inerrant. They are without error. And finally, they are so clear that they need to be used to judge all other writings. If you go to the solid declaration at the beginning of the Formula of Concord, which is the last of the great Lutheran confessions, Luther is quoted in the preface saying that 
you must use the scripture to judge all human writings. Uh, the, the only uh, historical uh, objection uh, to uh, this sort of thing uh, came from those who recognized that Luther had some problems with canonicity, with what books should be in the Bible. You noted from the quotations that I've just given you that Luther says uh, anything that's canonical, anything that properly goes into the Bible has all of these characteristics we've talked about. But uh, people have said, uh, historically, that since Luther had trouble holding to the canonicity of certain New Testament books, he didn't really be, believe in inerrancy. Uh, Luther had some difficulties with the book of James, of course, with the book of Revelation. These difficulties lessened as Luther's uh, career continued. And in the versions of the Bible, of his, of his uh, translation of, of Scripture, uh, that come later in his career, any critical remarks are softened, which is very interesting. Uh, why, why did Luther have such canonical problems? Well, uh, he saw James as conflicting with St. Paul on the matter of salvation by grace through faith alone. He thought that uh, James was presenting a works notion. Uh, of course, it wasn't necessary to interpret James that way. This was pointed out to Luther, and as I say, he softened his view in that regard. As to the book of Revelation, uh, what helped Luther to see its proper place in Scripture uh, came when someone pointed out to him uh, the passages about the whore that sitteth on the seven hills, obviously the Pope. So uh, that helped Luther a great deal in seeing the strong canonical possibilities uh, in the book of Revelation. But notice this, the canonicity issue is not at all the same as the inerrancy issue. These are two entirely different things. Luther says, if the book properly belongs in Scripture, it's going to be authoritative, inerrant, and clear. He had some trouble on, a, on, on, on certain books, for a while at least. Um, illustration. <clears throat> Suppose I come here in my prophet's robe, and I say to you, Lo, do you believe in the inerrancy of holy writ? And you say, of course. I say, all right. And I pull out this handsome edition of scripture, and I hand it to you and I say, so, this is an error, right? And you open it up, and it has the Old and New Testaments, but in between is, is bound the Mequon telephone directory. You say, I can't affirm that this is the inerrant word of God. You say, ha, 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 gotcha. You don't believe in inerrancy. But of course, that's not the problem in the slightest. The problem is that something uh, has been stuck in here that shouldn't be in here. And all of us would agree that if there were mistakes on canonicity, that those would have to be taken care of. But they would be independent of the issue of inerrancy. All right. Uh, <laughs> we move to the current theological scene. In the current theological scene, the picture that we get of Luther, and the picture that we get of inerrancy uh, is very, very different from what we've just been talking about. Uh, and what we want to do is to provide a few uh, typical quotations from contemporary or near contemporary scholars, uh, Lutheran scholars, for goodness sake, uh, who are presenting a very different approach from the approach that Luther presented. I begin with Joseph Sittler, who was a professor at the Chicago Lutheran Theological Seminary, uh, and he is now deceased. Uh, he uh, had great influence in what is now the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, said he, Sittler, all verbal forms, all means of communication through speech prove too weak for the massive bestowal of revelation. We must ask after the word of God in the same way that we ask after Jesus Christ. That is to say, the word of God becomes the word of God for us. To assert 
the inerrancy of the text of Scripture is to elevate to a normative position an arbitrary theological construction. Now, translating this from English into English, which is always necessary with, with uh, theologians, and the more liberal they are, the more translation is required. What this says is that the Bible is not the word of God per se. It must become the word of God. And it must become the word of God through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, that viewpoint was normative in uh, the so-called neo-orthodox theological circles uh, some, some years ago. All right. Here is Gerhard Forde, who died in 2005, uh, one of the leading theologians of the EALC. Says he, Inspiration... Uh, in this view, refers to the entire activity of the Spirit by which he dwells in the church and attends the proclamation of the word. That's his own view. In the older view, that is the kind of thing that we've been talking about, inspiration is too static and finally too anemic. It uh, <clears throat> seems to uh, assume that the Spirit can convinced of the truth only through a book without errors. The Spirit has a much more powerful means than that, uh, namely the two-edged sword of the Word through which he creates faith. The question, therefore, of whether or not these uh, uh, works, these human works, uh, uh, contain error is of no particular importance. Just as the pastor on Sunday may make errors of one sort or another in his preaching, uh, he still can proclaim the word, uh, the word of God. Often the question is asked of this method, if you submit that there are any errors in the little things, how do you know that uh, the errors don't exist in the big things as well? That is, since you start admitting errors, where do you stop? To this the only answer is, the faith born of the law gospel experience. Okay? Now, what is Florida saying? He's saying that what is really important is not the truth of the scripture per se. What's important is that it presents the gospel, it presents Christ, and as long as it does this, factual errors are irrelevant. Hmm? Uh, very interesting. And that is exactly the view that... Uh, was at the heart of the serious scriptural controversy that existed in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in the 1970s, uh, the so-called Seminex controversy. And in this controversy, uh, a number of professors at the Concordia Seminary St. Louis maintained what I termed, and it became a popular phrase, <laughs> gospel reductionism. Gospel reductionism. This was saying that the scripture is valuable in presenting the gospel, but it doesn't have to be true in other respects. In other respects, uh, the scripture can make all sorts of errors, but as long as it presents the gospel, uh, there's no problem, because the important thing is, after all, the gospel, and not any of the details that are presented in Holy Scripture. And uh, we have a quotation or two from people at that time. Uh, there, was, <clears throat> there was, of course, uh, the uh, article by Arthur Carl Peepcorn, whom I knew very well. What does inerrancy mean? This appeared in the old Concordia Theological Monthly. And uh, said uh, Peepcorn, uh, and this is a very careful quotation, so you must listen very, very closely uh, to it. Uh, said he, Uh, I want to get just the right quote here. The contention that where the stress is on a religious purpose, the biblical writer's concern with precise and literal accuracy uh, of uh, concomitant historical or scientific detail may recede into the background. That is to say, as long as the biblical writer is dealing with something of, of, of serious gospel significance, it, he can make all sorts of mistakes in background matters, in matters of science or history or, 
or geographical detail, or that sort of thing. This is an interesting notion because our Lord said at one point, if you have not believed me in earthly things, how will you believe me in heavenly things? Uh, in the area of analytical philosophy, there is the concept of the nonsensical or the meaningless. This consists of uh, making assertions that can't be verified or disconfirmed. They can't be confirmed or disconfirmed in any way. The fascinating thing is that in the spiritual realm, biblical statements can't be confirmed or disconfirmed. But the historical material, of course, can be either confirmed or disconfirmed. So the irony of a viewpoint like that of Peepcorn's is that in the areas where uh, there is the possibility of confirmation, says Peepcorn, oh, scripture errs all the time. There's no problem with that. You don't worry about that. Because after all, it's true in the areas of real importance, which are the spiritual areas, specifically the application of the gospel to the human heart. So what he's saying is, uh, uh, you can't believe scripture where you can check it, uh, but you've got to believe it in areas where you can't check it. This is what the analytical philosophers refer to as technical meaninglessness. All right, uh, and uh, well, I think that that's probably a sufficient example uh, or two of how uh, the, <clears throat> the mainline uh, theologians and even uh, those within Lutheranism have looked at scripture and have drawn Luther into it. Gerhard Ebeling, the German Lutheran theologian, uh, he took exactly the kind of view that I've just been describing and attributes this to Luther, that for Luther the importance of scripture is simply the gospel. Well, why would theologians do this? I mean, when through uh, Christian history from Augustine right on through to the Reformation, there is a uniform belief in the uh, significance of everything in the Bible. Why would they take a view that reduces scripture only to the gospel itself? Why would they engage in gospel reductionism? Well, the answer to this is, of course, the almost uniform acceptance in their circles of the higher criticism of the Bible. The higher criticism of the Bible. You ask, what's the higher criticism? Well, here's what it is. Lower critics, that is to say textual critics, work through the manuscript traditions to get the best text they can of biblical material. Uh, the texts that therefore are the closest to what the original authors wrote. When they're finished with this, <clears throat> you end up with a critical edition of either the New Testament or the Old Testament, and on the basis of these critical editions, translations occur into modern languages. If you take the critical editions today of the Greek New Testament, let's just look at those, if you take those and you compare the text with the text of the first published critical edition of the New Testament, which was done by Erasmus in 1516, the differences are almost nil. And that's why, no matter what contemporary translation into English you take uh, of the New Testament, and you compare this with the King James Bible, 1611, you find almost no differences. You find some, but the differences are generally trivial. Uh, in one instance, uh, a, a, a manuscript text which is, which is reflected in the translation will say, Jesus and his disciples walked along the Sea of Galilee. And in another it will say, they walked along the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus and his disciples are mentioned in a previous sentence or previous paragraph. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that, there, that the Bible was regarded with such uh, holiness uh, that uh, the copyists were terribly careful. And we have so many more copies and uh, so many, uh, so, uh, such fine copies that you have uh, very little difficulty with the textual tradition. All right. Now, the textual critic hands his results over to the higher critic. 
The higher critic receives these best texts, and he says, ah, I can go higher than that, or uh, I can go deeper than that. That is to say, I can read this stuff, and if I find stylistic differences and changes in the material, if I find uh, uh, variations in vocabulary, if I find apparent uh, uh, alterations in logic, and so forth, I can conclude that those best texts actually uh, are not uh, the, the final text. Uh, these texts then were really the product of earlier texts that were clumsily pasted together by editors uh, so as to give the impression that they were written by single individuals. Right? Uh, and uh, this, uh, this interesting notion uh, uh, arose in the, <coughs> in the uh, uh, Renaissance period, uh, but was particularly prominent in Germany, in German theological circles, in the 19th century. Uh, three Germans, Graf, Kienen, and Delhausen, uh, developed what they called the JEPD theory. They said uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, really, these, were not, these books weren't written by Moses. They were a paste-up of uh, four sources. One source that used uh, the word uh, Jehovah for God, or Yahweh, that's the J source. One that used uh, Elohim for God, that's the E source. Then there was the priestly material, P, uh, the P source, and the legal stuff, the Deuteronomic source, the D source. So this was the JEPD theory. By the time I was in theological seminary, because nobody could agree where one of these sources ended and another began, uh, they were already up to K. Morgenstern at Hebrew Union College was splitting the K document into K and K sub 1. Uh, the, the people who did this never could agree because there aren't any manuscripts to show the existence of these alleged sub-documents. One arrives at the conclusion that there were such only because the style apparently undergoes change and the vocabulary undergoes change. All right? Uh, this transferred to the New Testament uh, around uh, the turn of the 20th century, and uh, it, the same techniques were used in gospel criticism. The idea is that the gospels were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they were uh, uh, composites reflecting the belief systems of the early church in all its variations. And so what one has to do is to try to find the sources that stand behind the material as we have it. You may be interested to know that this technique has been tried in other scholarly fields. <laughs> and the result has been catastrophic. For example, uh, uh, Ugaritic studies. That's a, a cognate Semitic language, uh, Ugaritic. And Cyrus Gordon, the greatest authority in that field, said, if we don't stop messing around with our texts, uh, we are going to destroy all Ugaritic literature. Uh, when I was at Cornell University majoring in philosophy and classics, I had a classics professor who was a real wag, Harry Kaplan. And Kaplan said, for 75 years, we've been using this a uh, higher critical approach to find the true authors of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And after 75 years, we've come to the conclusion uh, that uh, if the Iliad and the Odyssey were not written by Homer, they were written by someone of the same name who lived about the same time. Uh, in other words, <laughs> the technique just doesn't work. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in his essay on biblical criticism, uh, said, they try, they've tried this uh, on my Narnian chronicles, and they've never been right, never once. And they're doing this in uh, a language that is common to both of us and in our own time. Uh, why do the biblical uh, critics think, the higher critics think, that they're going to be able to achieve this with materials that are at least 2,000 years old and in a language which isn't their native language and is no longer a living language? The problem with the higher criticism is, of course, that it is just bad scholarship. 
It is based on the assumption that you can determine authorship by style. <laughs> can you really do this? Um, if so, <clears throat> if someone found, in the case of the students, or, or uh, perhaps in the case of faculty, if, if someone found your term papers and your love letters and read both of them, would they arrive at the conclusion that it was the same author? Is the style and the vocabulary the same? Uh, is the logic of presentation the same? Well, if it is, if it is, you'll never get a degree or you'll never get married or both. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that this is not a, a, a proper method for determining authorship uh, or source. The way you do that is by objective manuscript materials. Once you have uh, achieved the best text, that's the time to shut up and listen to what it has to say. It is not time to stand over it and say, if I had written this, I wouldn't have written it that way. Listen. Uh, <laughs> that's why God didn't choose higher critics to write the Bible. The Lord wanted to do it his way, to quote Frank Sinatra. Uh, the, the, the Lord wanted to employ his stylistic approach to uh, Revelation, and uh, he it didn't conform to what uh, readers today, or particularly uh, certain theologians, think ought to be done with Holy Scripture. All right, you say, uh, well, thank goodness, thank goodness, we aren't uh, members of the two seed in the spirit predestinarian Baptists. Uh, thank goodness, we would not be troubled by any problems along this line. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is that uh, we should have learned a lesson back in the 1970s. And the lesson is that uh, the devil, he don't like denominations that hold to the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, the, the, the devil will, will go after uh, churches that are more orthodox with great energy. Uh, and uh, in the 1970s, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod came close to losing its classic Lutheran theology. And it did so because uh, certain professors at the Concordia Seminary St. Louis uh, held to the validity of a higher critical approach and uh, applied this to the scripture so as to reduce revelation to the gospel. They engaged in gospel reductionism. Uh, and uh, uh, by divine providence, this did not work out. Uh, today, however, I hate to tell you, uh, we have a, a new problem along this line. Um, there in the, and it's in the New Testament par department at Concordia, uh, St. Louis. I understand that this is being worked on. Uh, the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has met with the principals in this. Uh, the difficulty is that the head of the department is uh, one of the problems and the president of the seminary is not very concerned with getting the whole business dealt with. He is much more concerned with peace and quiet uh, in, in the church and we all want peace and quiet. Uh, however, as, as a lawyer who has dealt with certain medical problems, uh, if you have a cancer uh, difficulty, it's better to have radical surgery as quickly as possible. If you allow a problem to sit, uh, the difficulty is not going to go away. The problem is going to become more acute. Well, what is the difficulty? We have a professor who did a paper entitled The Authority of the Scriptures. Sounds great the authority of the scriptures. And here's what he says. Listen closely. If you want to rip Romans 15 and 16 out of my Bible, I can live with that. If you want Hebrews, James, Revelation torn out too, I can live with that. If you force me uh, to uh, look only at P48, that is a, a papyrus fragment, just a little bit of, of, of scripture, uh, B46, uh, or the bizarre manuscript W, or thousands of Byzantine minuscules, uh, 
and make them my New Testament. I can live with that. All right? Uh, <clears throat> I, can, I could live with or without any of these because even these poorly copied, corrupted by people, uh, edited, uh, preach Christ. And if they preach Christ, they are of the Spirit. For preaching Christ is the Spirit's work. And if they preach Christ, they are apostolic. For the apostle can speak nothing other than what he has been sent to speak. So apostles, no matter who they are, even one who has been aborted, like uh, St. Paul, who once persecuted the church, preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can live without a perfect Bible. I cannot live without God raising Jesus from the dead. On the other hand, force me to read only the Gospel of Thomas. That's a Gnostic Gospel, not part of the, of the New Testament, late, second century. I cannot live with that. Or the Koran, or the Book of Mormon. Not because they are not inerrant or perfect, or even human, but because there is no gospel. There is no life in Christ. Now what this passage says is, the only important thing is whether the gospel is present. If the gospel is present, great. If the gospel isn't present, uh, we can't. Uh, go with those materials, but we certainly can go with materials that are fallible and erroneous. We can go with biblical materials of that kind as long as they preach Christ. This is very much like that statement uh, back in the 70s uh, uh, that uh, <coughs> one theologian uh, said, and we, we, we quoted this, that just like the preacher on Sunday, he can make all sorts of mistakes, but as long as he preaches the gospel, there isn't a problem. Listen, the reason the analogy breaks down is that the preacher is subject to authority, but the Bible isn't. And so, if you try to use the preacher analogy, what, what's going to judge the erroneous content of, of Scripture, for goodness sake? Scripture will no longer be the judge. Scripture will be the victim. Uh, this same uh, professor uh, did an article uh, in which he refers to the biblical text as plastic, the plastic text of scripture. Says he, uh, the textual critic, not the higher critic, but the textual critic is constantly coming across variations in other manuscripts, new material, uh, therefore you don't ever have a solid biblical text. The text is plastic. Uh, but, says he, the Holy Spirit works in the church uh, to provide you with a text that you can live with. Now, uh, what, what does that do? What it does is to change the locus of authority from the Bible to the church. If Luther had taken that view, he could never have had a Reformation. Uh, the point of the Reformation was that the church had deviated from Scripture and needed to be brought back to Holy Scripture. Scripture was the judge over the church. But if you take that kind of a theory of textual criticism, for goodness sake, the final authority is not the text. The final authority is the church that uh, reflects the Holy Spirit and gives you Scripture. That is exactly what the Roman Catholic theology maintains. If you maintain that, you know, get a ticket to Rome immediately. That is exactly how the Roman church has regarded Holy Scripture as the church's gift, and the church stands as its uh, authority, and the church stands as its interpreter. And without the church, uh, the scripture uh, really is not much use to people. And most recently, the same professor has done an article in which he argues that the Magnificat, the Magnificat, was not spoken by Mary, but was spoken by Elizabeth. Now, that's not a doctrinal issue at all. Uh, I mean, if, if the Magnificat had been spoken by the mailman who had walked in at that point uh, and uh, had a sudden spiritual experience and uh, gave the Magnificat, the Magnificat would be exactly the same, uh, and there isn't anything uh, the matter with such a thing happening. The trouble is how this same professor arrives at the conclusion that Elizabeth and not Mary presented the Magnificat. 
because the textual authorities are all, all of them of any significance whatsoever, are in favor of Mary. Uh, and that's why the, uh, <coughs> the uh, translations of the Bible that you have, whether they're Roman Catholic or, or Protestant, all present Mary as doing the Magnificat. Okay? Why then does this professor say, uh, I'm going to uh, accept Elizabeth rather than Mary, uh, as a result, uh, the, the, where Mary appears in a very, very small number of late texts? Why? Well, he studied under a professor, Eliot, who says, the critic is able to select freely from among the available fund of variants and choose the one that best fits the internal criteria. Now, translating from English into English, what that, what that means is that uh, the, 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 the critic or the theologian is perfectly able to choose among all uh, variant possibilities according to the reading that in that uh, theologian's belief best fits the totality of the text. Okay? In other words, from a literary standpoint, he can pick a reading which, in his opinion, works better than another reading. And that is exactly the reasoning that's used here. And I will read you one line and you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. Were the Magnificat placed on the lips of Mary, it would be the only time she verbalizes praise to the Lord. Such a verbalization would not be consistent with her characterization elsewhere in Luke. That is to say, uh, Mary doesn't praise the Lord along the lines of the Magnificat elsewhere in Luke. It's only here. And therefore, it really doesn't fit into uh, the characterization of Mary that you find elsewhere. Uh, and uh, it, it therefore uh, doesn't provide as neat a literary picture as we would like to have. Now, what does this assume? It assumes that biblical books are not recounting history, but instead are literary composites. And the writers are uh, developing the material uh, in order to present material that is as effective as possible. That, of course, is not in any way Luther's view. Luther actually thought that the stuff was presenting factual truth. He actually thought that Jonah was swallowed by the beast. Uh, and uh, he actually thought that, that the, uh, the, the, the uh, Christmas narratives uh, were, uh, re were describing what had actually happened. But this kind of thing reduces the scripture to a literary model instead of a historical model. Um, look, suppose, suppose someone writes up my talk, and they write up the talk uh, indicating that I first began uh, speaking about scripture as authoritative, uh, and then reliable, and finally as clear. And uh, they say, uh, really, a better order would have been uh, to start out with questions of clarity and then maybe questions of reliability and finally to come down to the really important issue, which was the question of authority. Now, I would be very disturbed if somebody then wrote the thing up that way on the ground that what I really was doing was trying to produce a literary narrative or the reporter was trying to produce a literary narrative. The fact of the matter is that uh, even if the order and the coherence and the characterization is not what you'd like it to be, tough, you aren't the person who did it. Uh, and the idea is to record what in fact happens, not what you think ought to have happened. All right, so we have this same problem of gospel reductionism uh, rearing its ugly head again. Why did Luther consider the authority, the reliability, 
and the clarity of Holy Scripture so important? I'll tell you why. Because he recognized that the real human condition, not a literary story, but the real human condition is that we are lost and we desperately need an objective historical redemption. And if you give up even the details of scripture, you are reducing the historical reliability of the thing and therefore its ability to convey salvation. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, says Paul. Well, if that's the case, and you somehow uh, denature the word, then you are going to denature the salvation that it presents, inevitably. And that's been the case in all major uh, mainline denominations in the United States. Uh, the Presbyterian Church in the USA was one of the great bulwarks of orthodoxy. And then weak-minded administrators said, well, we believe the gospel, but we think there ought to be greater variety among faculty. And so uh, faculty members came into the picture who didn't believe in that, and eventually the whole institution went down the drain as far as Orthodox Christianity is concerned. That resulted in uh, the formation of the Westminster Theological Seminary, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and so on. We could give examples across the board uh, in American church history. The fact is that the approach to Christianity has got to be a factual approach, not a literary approach. It's got to be a factual approach. We need to regard the Bible as Luther regarded it and as all of Christian history has regarded it, as something that is conveying uh, a record of what God has in fact done for us. He in fact came to earth in Jesus Christ. That is an incarnation in reality. It isn't a literary uh, stylistic uh, affair. This isn't Alice in Wonderland for goodness sake. Down the rabbit hole. This happens to be God Almighty coming down out of heaven in order to uh, deal with our actual historical need. If the scripture is reduced to some kind of a literary model. How is it going to save anybody? Answer, it isn't. And uh, therefore, I'm going to uh, conclude now with one final quotation from uh, Dr. Martin. And here it is. If a different way to heaven existed, no doubt God would have recorded it. But there is no other way. This, by the way, is his commentary on John 3.16. Hmm? Therefore, let us cling to these words, firmly, uh, firmly uh, uh, place and rest our hearts upon them, close our eyes and say, although I had the merit of all the saints, the holiness and purity of all virgins, and the piety of St. Peter himself, I would still consider my attainments as nothing. Rather, I must have a different foundation to build on. Namely, these words, God has given his Son so that whoever believes in him, uh, whom the Father has sent, shall be saved. Uh, and you must confidently insist that you will be preserved, and you must boldly take your stand on his words, which, uh, which no devil, hell, or death can suppress. Thank you. I was told that this should end at one, and I have ended at one minute before one, so there's a chance for a really fast question or two. Uh, I'm willing to stay longer, but I understand that a lot of people have got to get to, uh, to, other, to classes and so on. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, what a restrained group. Or maybe I can't see you. Are you quivering and I'm not recognizing you? No? All right, uh, yes. In regard to uh, making the defense of scripture, as you've done so well, a lot of people have this idea, even though they haven't read the uh, scholars, the liberals, and so on, but they do have the idea, the man in the street has the idea that the Bible has errors in it. Yep. And uh, what does one say in uh, 25 words or less when he says, well, I don't have to believe it because I've heard and I know people who are college educated who don't believe it.
so they just blow it off. Yeah. Well, what, what, what I do is to say this. Uh, Jesus Christ, for whom there is solid historical evidence of having risen from the dead and thereby demonstrated his deity, said that the Bible was errorless and that it is possible to deal with alleged errors and contradictions. Now I said, now I say, uh, there are a lot of people who take a different viewpoint. But, last we heard, they have not risen from the dead, nor demonstrated their deity, and therefore it would be, in my opinion, far wiser if one went along with God Almighty in this matter than not. Now, now that, of course, will immediately raise the question, well, what makes you think he rose again from the dead, etc.? That's just what I want them to do because then we can get into the question of the historicity of the life of Christ. We can take them to the New Testament, and they can discover what Jesus' approach to Scripture is. And if they are saved, if they come to a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will enter their heart, and when they read the Bible subsequently, uh, you will have an ally that you never had before. They will begin to look at the Bible with far greater appreciation uh, than they ever were capable of, of, of doing it uh, previously. Uh, and I think that this is so much more effective than trying to deal with contradiction A and then contradiction B and C. That can go on until just after the last judgment. Uh, it's, it's far better to get to the heart of this, why we believe the whole thing is solid. Uh, and uh, if people can come to Christ, then they will uh, attempt to give the scripture the benefit of the doubt. That was 67 words, by the way, instead of only 25. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. We thank you very much. Cap, yes. do you have any idea about obtaining other uh, talks that are in the series? This gentleman asked me, and I don't know. I'm just the lecturer. I don't know anything about the organization of the series. I think uh, Tim Maschke would know about that. Um, I can try to address that. Um, I, I mean, Tim is a Today was not a day of reference, you mean, or did they, the two, the yesterday?
hard with stu you know, students, obviously, are, it's, it's hard to one, one size, one time fits all. But I think, sure, right there, yeah. I think historically for the other meetings, like for yeah. lunchtime, one is not as well attended as the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it varies year by year. But I mean, I can certainly, you know, take that. I'm not saying, you know, I'm saying, we hold it. We hold it. If, I know some of them are sharing, um, I forget which colleague was saying, like Wheaton or some of the other schools where it's more kind of even part of the curriculum in a way that they have these sort of external lectures. Some that professors, some professors. You have to go on. Since then, it's been a lot of